Let's go here. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, Darren Doherty is my name, and um, I'm here with Walter and Diddy, but uh, Diddy's just got her bookcase there at the moment. Here she is. <laughs> Getting tea and water for everyone. <laughs> Walter? Hi, yeah. Hi, everyone. Now, Walter, um, I'm, I wasn't going to embarrass myself because there's not much worse for an Australian, as you would well know, um, by pretending that I know how to pronounce your surname. So can you give us the official version, please, sir? Yeah, well, look, it's Yena. Yena. So that's how it's pronounced, Yena. Yeah, it comes from an old university town in East Germany, or what was East Germany called Yena. Yena. And yeah, it was a big centre for optics and science way back 1200. That's history, you know, so here I am. Somehow you found yourself in Australia. And yeah, uh, yeah. Somehow you found yourself, I think, are you in Vermont at the moment? Yeah, look, here we are in Vermont. We've actually got a 24 workshop, conference, meetings, sort of a program across America, uh, all on sort of, yeah, in different locations, California, really interesting thing, Rehydrate California and talking to the local people there. And so that's been very successful. And then we're in Kansas with Gal Fuller looking at that whole Prairie country, the whole, you know, brain built sort of uh, ecologies, but also the challenges, the regenerative challenges they're facing. And of course, now we're on the eastern states, and again, it'll just keep on going. We'll end up in Canada, and before I get home, I have to go to Sweden. So, yeah. Oh, well, gee, well, you're, you're, at, you're out and about. Absolutely. Well, we'll... came through before on the way here, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll... Um... We'll have a look at the, uh, as, as we get towards the end of the um, discussion today, we'll have a look at all of the events because there's quite a number that are coming up across the United States and, um, and elsewhere. So um, we'll have a look at those a bit later and uh, catch up on, what, on how the tour is going and what your ambitions are. Okay, very good. Yeah, but um, it's, uh, it's great to, to have this opportunity um, uh, to, to talk to you both and uh, well worth me getting up at 3 a.m. to do so. And, um, and I don't know what time it is there, but uh, and it's it's uh, but uh, we needed to fit in with your busy schedule, which um, I had a look. And as someone who's done the odd tour or two, it's uh, you're doing it. You're doing a fair bit. There's a bit of crisscrossing there. Yeah, yeah. So who, whose idea was the uh, was the tour? Well, look, uh... <laughs> we've been trying for quite a while. Yeah. Um, at the end, I'll just give a little history that. Um, yeah. I met Walter in 2015 at a water conference at Tufts where my students were doing that you know, sort of well-known bread and flour demo to talk about the soil sponge, but we didn't, I don't think we had a name for it. We didn't know the word soil sponge. And Walter was talking about um, global cooling through the hydrological cycles. And so we got talking afterwards and then our friend Brian said, hey, Walter and Tom want to spend a few days in the country. And would you like to adopt them? And I said, absolutely. So he came up here then, and uh, I just had my tape recorder going the whole time and my note got out. Yeah. And then, uh, then we, got, we got invited to speak in Ohio. He was already invited to speak before that. So he said, how about I come and we'll talk some more and you, you give them the whole uh, sponge narrative in Ohio. So then, and then, we, but then we got to spend 10 days and we put together a Vermont conference. This was back in December, 2016. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had a four day or three day conference then. And at the end of that, uh, we were trying to figure out what was next. And we had this whole exercise going with people with sticky notes on the wall. And you know, everybody was fighting about what should or shouldn't happen and reinventing the wheel and inventing new nonprofit names. And everyone was getting more and more kind of low energy as we saw all this work unfolding in front of us. And Walter said, hey, you haven't counted my vote yet. <laughs> down here by the floor, down under. <laughs> and he said, look, we're just reinventing the wheel here, but what if we were to organize around an audacious goal? Mm -hmm. Something like, can we rehydrate California? At which point, all of our energy came back up again. And um, so I kind of put that and ran with it and organized a full-on tour this time. Um, yeah. 
and mm -hmm. and it was it was pretty pretty, pretty what, far, what happened in california yeah, yeah. And it goes big, of course, global because with climate change, it's the aridification of regions that really we're facing. Water's the thing that next 10 years is going to be the key thing. And yeah, like in Australia, arid, you know, dehydration, aridification. And so what are we going to do about it? How do we practically use our soil carbon sponge, infiltration, retention, longevity of green, both cool, healthy biosystem food, now, more importantly, once we can do that, we can hydrologically cool regions on the planet safely and naturally, yeah. which is really that whole narrative. And see, in this tour, Darren, it's been, yeah, here's what we can do, but also it opens up new horizons beyond the CO2 emission reductions in terms of climate. Yes, grassroots regional activity can naturally safely cool those regions, buffer the extremes, and give us a future. So I think that's been taken extremely positively, and actually all the people, all the places we've talked to, have seen that to say, look, yes, here are here's a way, here are ways forward, whereas before it was looking pretty gloom and doom, just on the CO2 story. Yeah, it seems that uh, in 2007, when we did our first uh, soil, water, and carbon for every farm tour, which was a play on uh, P. A. Yeoman's uh, book yep. title of Water for Every Farm. Um, one of the things that was an outcome of that was a presentation I called Blue Before Green and Black. Um, mm -hmm. And what that means, in a sense, is that uh, you have to have water in your system before you can um, have green or vegetation and cash flow. And, uh, and, uh, and black, which is uh, carbon as a residue of that, um, and, uh, and profit uh, or profitability. Yeah. So... Yeah, I think we're all we're all following a similar narrative in different oh, no, ways. Totally, and yeah. of course the bottom line, as you see, it's water that governs ninety-five percent of the heat dynamics of the blue planet. Yeah, CO two three point eight percent, and so really it's now at a point where if we're going to cool it, we're going to buffer it. We've got to get back to the you know the real yeah. drivers, but that means we've got to rebuild the sponge. So it's a cycle. We need the carbon in the soil give us a sponge, give us the hydrology to give us a chance to cool it, right? So it's all one, plants, carbon, water in that total cycle. So water in itself is a greenhouse gas. Um, yes. Uh, Alan Yeoman spoke of that in his book, uh, Priority One, How Together yep. We Can uh, Save the World from Global Warming. Can you speak a little bit to the role of water as a greenhouse gas and and because okay. in a lot of this, it's about, it's about where things are at some sort of stage in the cycle, isn't it? Um, you know, we okay. have a little bit too much carbon in the atmosphere. We have a little bit too much water vapour in at levels yeah. in the atmosphere. Can yeah. you speak to some of that? Yeah. Okay. Well, look, uh, yeah, very important, Darren. And perhaps just step one further, step back at one more. See, there's three factors that drive both the natural and the abnormal greenhouse that we're in, right? And of course, there's CO2 molecules in the air, the concentration now from 280 to 406. But really, it's a very minor component of the total, right? There's obviously water vapor molecules in the atmosphere. And as we said, 406 parts per million CO2, but there's 40,000 parts per million water vapor molecules. And each water molecule can absorb heat eight times more effectively than a CO2 molecule. Mm. So that gives you, in a sense, a proportionality of water to CO2. The problem, though, is in terms of molecules, the CO2 is there constantly. We can model it mathematically, whereas the water molecules change rapidly and massively in time and space and totally impossible to model. Mm. So they've been dropped off, you know, the whole climate modeling mm. scenario exercise because, no, we can't put it into mathematics that easily. But the really the big thing that governs the greenhouse isn't the molecules in the air, but actually how much de-radiated infrared energy is coming from the Earth's surface. Because basically the greenhouse is the amount of energy absorbed by these gases. And really, if we can turn down the enemy energy being re-radiated, then we can actually naturally safely turn down the greenhouse. Yeah. Okay, and this comes back to land management because a cool, moist, grassed 
um, vegetation very rarely gets above 20 centigrade yeah. in the soil. Yeah. Whereas if we know, like if we've got a bare, fallow soil surface or bitumen, you can't walk on it at 60 degrees centigrade. Yeah, plus. Yeah. It is a simple rule of physics. It's a Stefan Boltzmann equation, and the amount of re radiation is relationship related to the fourth power of the temperature of the soil surface. It's temperature times temperature times temperature times temperature. It's in degrees Kelvin, so there's a bit of um, mathematics there. But the point being that the amount of energy being re radiated from a hot, air fellow, degraded, as a landscape is massively higher and in a sense that's the key driver of the greenhouse yeah, yeah. and we can actually turn down the heat we can turn down the greenhouse by just saying okay we need more of the land surface grass protected moist cool covered and you know the power of basically just good land management and doing that so really, uh, it's that empowerment of local you know, land management to cool the planet regionally, which is really the new breakthrough. So one of the things that's interested me as a theory, and I haven't had the opportunity to talk to someone like you about this. I did talk to Alan Yeomans about it, and he didn't really agree see much sense in my theory, but I'll give this another crack with you. <laughs> uh, it's... It's well well noticed that in on the continent of Australia, um, the great southerly systems that we have coming through um, appear to be getting well, not appear. They are getting yeah. lower. They're getting lower and lower, and so Tasmania might get it. And even then, they Absolutely. they they lick the, uh, the 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 bottom of Tasmania and miss yep. not only the continent but also the uh, also Tasmania. Now. One of the things that I considered um, is that because of this 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 function yep. that you've just described, that and because of the reduced landscape function that has yep. happened on our continent since yep. European settlement, that Australia, but that that all of this background radiation is actually forcing away these uh, these cloud masses, um, and so and so so that. Uh, so that you know, as as well, we know that um, we know that uh, southeast and western, uh, sorry, southwest and western Australia, um, southwestern Victoria and southern Victoria yep. and Tasmania, shared with California, um, yep. the tallest vascular plants on the planet, yep. and they've since gone, as yep. has. And as has that uh, whole perennial base to those landscapes in perennial native grasses, which both California and Victoria and South, Southwest and Western Australia have, they're all gone. We've moved to an annualised, desertifying landscape. It doesn't seem to me that that's a really good landscape that would attract rain. No, it isn't. And actually, it's not a theory of yours. It's you know proven meteorological fact. And the evidence is very simple. Um, okay, as... As the Earth has absorbed more heat, the Hadley cells, which are those tropical, heat-absorbing, high-pressure cells that go up, they've been intensifying, and they've been expanding because that intensification poles. And in a sense, they've been pushing the cool winter feral cells that come up from the southern and northern oceans, respectively. They've been pushing them about 300 kilometres further south and north, respectively, mm -hmm. right? And so regions like Western Australia, southwest Western Australia, now aren't getting the winter rainfall they used to. Mm -hmm. Nor is California, nor is the Mediterranean region tapping in all those belts. And all of that, 30, all of that thirty to forty degree latitude sort of area. So exactly, Spain, Syria, California, Australia, southwest Africa. You know, they're all basically experiencing. That sort of situation. It's, it's, it's been great for the gliders and it's been great for the paragliders, but not so good for agriculture. No, 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 well, it's, it's very serious because, like in California, 40% of America's food is grown in the San Yankon Central, Central Valley. Valley. Yeah, Central Valley, yeah. Valley. And of course, if that aridifies it, which it is, then it's cactus, right? So, very serious. And of course, we know the misery of Syria because, again, it's had a 
30% systemic aridification, peasants leaving the fertile crescent, you know, for the last 15 years, and we know that fertile crescent's been there for 10,000 years. Take a look at agriculture. So, no, very fundamental thing. So that's the first thing. And the second thing you mentioned too is actually right down the as, and what I said before, as you clear and desertify country, it heats up more, you get much, much more re-radiation, and that creates high-pressure heat zones over these inland, drier desert areas, right? Mm. So you've got high-pressure you know, heat coming up and creating this heat zone, and, of course, cool, moist air, low-pressure air can't push over a high-pressure dome, and so... Aridification, desertification intensifies itself. Yeah. Six thousand years ago, we had an Australian monsoon, you know, from the northwest coming into Central Australia, and in a sense, we still have the gallery rainforest remnants, you know, Palm yeah. Valley, Alice, yeah. you know them yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See, and they're still there. But the point is, for the last six thousand years, our land management has created this high-pressure heat zone, and now we very rarely actually get as monsoonal is extending into middle Australia. Well, Same good. applies in yeah. southwest US, and it's here to come. So our land management becomes critical mm. if we're going to prevent and limit these sorts of aridification effects. That's really interesting in the case of Australia post-glaciation, post, post the last glaciation, you're yeah. suggesting that uh, land management changes have, have, have uh, changed this with our Aboriginal people. Um, so with uh, with that, that that would tend to be supported by Bruce Pascoe's uh, oh, absolutely. piece in which he su suggested it was only the last three to 5,000 years that Indigenous Australians started to practice something that we might call agriculture. Yeah. Mm. Look, it's, it's, I mean, again, we've got a lot of the data in Australia. I mean, I don't know if your international audience is... Well, yeah. I mean, it's relevant everywhere. Okay. Of course. After the last ice age, uh, we lost the megafauna, right? Correct. The on, and they were browsers, and they just ate prodigious quantities of sclerophyllous, you know, shrub because it was they such low. They were the elephants of our continent, yeah. Yeah, and well, they were just alimentary canals because they'd eat, they'd eat so much, it was so low nutrition, and obviously that was all then biofertilizer, soil carbon. But when they went, and the last fossils we've got in Burroughs, South Australia, 5,000 years ago, when they went, I mean, they would have gone a bit before that, but basically, you know, Australia, we had a massive build-up of fuel. And basically, the whole country would barbecue, and our carbon records in soil sediments prove that. Hmm. And so the Aborigines very skillfully and very rapidly had to learn cool mosaic control burning, right? Fuel hmm. reduction hmm. burning. And the women, of course, did that very, very well as they harvested. They would then burn, burn, burn patches. These were relatively cool, benign fires. But if they didn't do that, the whole country would just be a wildfire, right? Yeah. And so it was really survival, you know, that they needed to adapt that fire stick farming. As Bruce says, you know, the last 6,000 years, roughly, and all our pollen analysis and our charcoal record yeah. in lake sediments confirmed that we went from a casuarina elytris grassland into spinifex, mulga, eucalypt, fire-prone, fire-accelerating ecology. Yeah, we became a, a nation of pyrophytes. Yep, yep, yeah. absolutely. And, and, and but not, not in a negative thing that we had to because without that, the whole thing would have been barbecued. So in your study and in your travels since, have you found that other parts of the world uh, uh, post, post the last glaciation went in the same direction? We got, having spent a bit of time in California and read uh, some of the pieces there, it seems that California and Indigenous people were native grass harvesters. They also had the benefit of, uh, of oak trees as well, which Australians don't. So they had that, yeah. that form of uh, staple carbohydrate whereas our staple carb carbohydrates were native grass seed and yeah. uh, underground tubers. Is it something that you've seen in other parts of the world? So well, look, uh, yeah, uh, aspects of that story, California, you know, because, again, they had a lot of megafauna, you know, elephants, horses, camels here. They died out again in mm. the last ice age. But the period there, again, was a question of how do we manage. 
Mm. Certainly fires come up, but as you said, the oak forest haven't got anything like the fuel load no. that we have. And the same thing applies to South Africa and the Karoo, right? Because mm. they're the first Dutch settlers when they got there, the Karoo was burdened, right? It was beautiful. Literally tens of millions of antelope and springbok, and it was a burden thing. Now it's basically a desert. Mm. And again, it was this case of, I mean, okay, two things can happen to a grass. You can either burn it or you can buy it a jester. Mm. Okay, it's either eaten by an animal and turned into biofertilizer and more green grass, or it just goes rank, dry, burns, and desertifies. Yes. And that's the story in all three habitats. Right, suppose Australia, South Africa were the more extreme. And, and, and uh, the Mediterranean Rim as well. And the Mediterranean as well, right? Yes, um, yes. Again, the Romans got all their animals for the Colosseum from Libya, right? Yes. The banner. Yes. You don't want to go to Libya now to no. look for a lion or a hippopotamus, yeah? No, no, that's right. No, it's, it's quite breathtaking again. And it, and it sort of, it's all evidence that the same story is is kind yeah. of un unfolded. It's just the time of human settlement, particularly European settlement, that's, uh, that's been UNEP. somewhat of the coup de grace. Okay, and we have UNEP data very, very simply. Yeah, we've created 5 billion hectares of man-made desert and wasteland over the last 8,000 years. Hmm. Well, that's an Five, interesting figure because that's... 40% of the 13.9 billion hectares of land, including mountains and what have you. Mm. And we have about 5 billion hectares of agricultural land now. Uh, um, 1.5 billion hectares of crop land and yes. then about uh, 4 or 5 billion hectares of rangeland, depending on yeah. you know, where you cut off. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, again... Um, People like Alan Yeomans, and I'll speak about him because I know him quite well. Mm -hmm. He's been a, a lifelong friend. Um, he was one of the first people, well, he was the first person that I ever came across um, with his Esalen um, conference in 1991, where he talked about the role of soil and carbon and, and mm -hmm. worked out himself, uh, as Alan is prone to do, um, <laughs> That, um, that if we increase soil carbon contents by, I think it was about 1.6% on those 5 billion hectares, well, and that would do the job, as it were, in terms of the download. Okay. Is, that, is, okay. that some, is that something that stacks up for you? Oh, look, absolutely. And I've got to go to Sweden in May, and it's a negative emissions conference that follows from the whole IPCC, you know, 2015. And it's, yeah, look, here's the target. We're drawing down 20 billion tonnes of carbon per annum. But the key thing is not just to draw it down. That's good enough. But no, it's to rebuild the Earth's soil carbon sponge. Yes. Rebuild the Earth's hydrology, because only that gives us the green plants, the food, the water, and only that can give us the hydrological cooling. So what comes first, Walter, uh, Diddy? Um, you know, we're, you know, you know, it's, it's going to be the question. We can, we can, we can wax lyrical all day about everything that's going on and all of the effects, et cetera. Or, well, I'm a producer and I'm very, I'm, I'm already on board um, based on what you've said here. Yeah. What, are, what, are, what are the, what are the, I'm in California or if I'm in one of these Mediterranean landscapes, what, what are some of the first things? That starting I can point. Do? Yeah. Yeah, look, it's very simple and it's absolutely clear and escapable. Um, you have to go back when I was younger, 420 million years ago. <laughs> I'm pretty old. <laughs> but the point is that... So no, you're, low, you're lower Devonian. Mm. Well, exactly. <laughs> but the point is the world was oceans with life in the oceans and then bare, arid, dry rock. Mm. No life on land 420 million years ago. Mm. Of course, the starting point were, in fact, fungi, right? Mm. And fungi colonizing from the oceans onto land to solubilize nutrients because that was limiting life in the oceans. And those fungi then teamed up with algae to form blue, I mean, form lichens, blue green algae to form lichens and really started pedogenesis, mm -hmm. soil formation, which is mm -hmm. organic detritus being mixed up in the mineral detritus, creating water holding capacity. So the starting point, no question, Darren, is fungi, mm. creating organic matter, creating soils, and then very rapidly, life evolved from, yeah, these lichens to mosses to ferns to liverworts 
to cycads, to gymnospin, dangiospin, and re more recently grasses, can very rapidly, as you say, basically carboniferous permian, life extended right across the 13.9 billion hectares of land on this planet, right? Mm -hmm. And really it's pedogenesis soil formation, which is really the carbon in the soil to create water that allowed that plant system to grow. So you can't separate them, mm. but it's really soil formation, pedogenesis through those grams of carbon from the detritus of these fungi, the glomalin, mm -hmm. and then the humates creating soils, you know, that soil carbon sponge, and then the whole thing just snowballs in that synergy. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to answer that in a, in a, a more local way because, you know, we, we were in California and a lot of people were asking, so, okay, we, we get it, we're interested in this, but what do, what do we do? Mm -hmm. And to me, from my perspective, and I'm, you know, I mean, just mine, but, but I think it makes sense talking about the system that Walter's talking about. In the Central Valley right now, uh, which is which is goes almost entirely the length of of, of uh, sorry, not Australia, which because where are we now? <laughs> almost the entire length of California. Yes. Uh, there's a huge amount of bare fallow and non covered no co no cover crops. Yeah. There's also now a push in terms of water conservation to set land aside out of production. Yes. So one of the partners that we're working with is Sequoia Riverlands Trust, which is a big land trust in the Central Valley. Mm -hmm. uh, they're working on a project to try to get the land that's being set out of production, not left as bare fallow, but put into um, pasture. Yes. Uh, um, and, so, and so that's one thing that I think is a great, would be a great idea. Secondly, uh, is, to, is to just try to get people thinking about a longer term vision of what a cover crop means. Yes. I think a lot of people say, well, we don't have the water to grow a cover crop. Yes. But if, if, but if, if or it's going it's gonna, it's gonna to rob the crop. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that may be true the first year, year and a half. Mm -hmm. If you think long term and say, look, if we can, if we can basically invest some of our water for a year into cover crops, we can change that high pressure heat dome in the Central Valley. We can get rid of some of the humid hazes, which mm. we'll talk about more. Mm. And we can pull that, that atmospheric river of, uh, of moisture in, up in the air down into the ground and have a sponge ready and waiting to hold it. Which so is which is something that, which is a climatic effect that really defines California. I mean, it's you go there in yep. July and August, and um, as one place, and it and all of that, uh, all of the uh, fogs, the famous fogs, don't actually yes. make it make it as far inland as they were. Can you just as a just as a point on that though for both of you, um, going back to the one I made before about uh, that that um, reflect. Uh, I don't know how you put it, uh, Walter. Where you've got that, that, yeah, you've got that re-radiation, background radiation that's occurring. Uh, is that is that increasing more Virga activity uh, and more hail? Because as those strata, as cumulus then becomes strata cumulus, yep. they get so heavy with water that they still rain, and so you get Virgas, which so the water evaporates before it hits the land, but you also get hail when it's particularly heavy clouds. Yep. Well, look, certainly it massively increases instability and a whole lot of, I mean, atmospheric physics is pretty complex, you know, a whole sure. lot of processes. But it, yeah, again, that's why it's too hard to model mathematically. But yeah, you get more extremes, tornadoes, all those sorts of effects, flood, right? Flood, flooding type rains. Well, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, yeah, yep, it, it's all that. Just, just, I want to make another point because we talked about 420 million years ago, and hey, you can say that's a long time. See, we had exactly the same thing happen 8,000 years ago. We had the glacial till that came from Canada which formed, in a sense, the Great Plains of America. In the space of eight, 9,000 years, it's those that process, plants, carbon, that has built these prairie soils, some of the world's most productive, deepest soils, you know, 10 metres, 8% carbon, roots down to 5, 6 metres, and the whole prodigious 
American Midwest prairie ecology was all built in the last 8,000 years. And the powerful point is that, yes, it can happen that fast. We can do it that fast. And as you said, Alan and others, it's 10 tons carbon per hectare per annum through just ecological regenerative farming practices, which is, in a sense, the challenge now. How do we get that carbon from the air into the soil to rebuild the sponge, hydrology, cooling, to the water people and food and futures? So, Diddy, coming back to your point there about the Central Valley and all of that, one of the things that uh, many people would or perhaps would or wouldn't understand is that places like that were... Um, hydrologically intact in other words you know you've got it's called the san joaquin valley that would suggest that there's actually some river systems in there and there's a some flow lines and that they themselves were filled with uh, wetland vegetation which which uh, it, which is which is another um sink of carbon that uh, we've largely uh, channelized now as a result of and you know, I know that having been in that area and many others, that uh, a lot of those areas now have been purposely channelised. So they've been, even been boarded up and bricked up. So mm-hmm. that there is very, and they get, they get, when they get choked with weeds, um, they then are assiduously cleaned of those weeds because the, the role of wetland species is to not, well, they, they don't accumulate their biomass downwards, they accumulate their biomass upwards. And so their job is to, is to not channelise. So mm-hmm. when, we, when we look at this whole discussion that you're having, are, are you looking at, um, you know, the sort of the vision of, of rehydration through the whole system? Um, or are we just starting at the top of the catchment you know, what sort of narrative are you playing then, Diddy, in terms of this well, sponge concept? I mean, I, I think that there's two different pieces there. There's, there's what do we do with the water that's moving on mass, right? Mm-hmm. Whether it's a, whether it's a swamp or whether it's a river or whether it's an aqueduct. But more importantly, is is what we've been calling the in-soil reservoir, which is which is spread out across the entire landscape and can hold a tremendous amount of water. Mm-hmm. And also take some of the pressure off of the potential for flooding. You know, if you look at the, the curve of a you know a flood event with our current typical landscape, you have this huge peak flow after the rain, and then it and then it drops off. But if you have a, a landscape with an intact in-cell reservoir, an intact sponge, then after the rain, that it's a much more gradual much more gradual curve and you don't have flooding and you don't have drought, you know, mm. so you have, you have less of each. Mm. I think it took me a while to understand that flooding and drought are the same phenomenon, yes. you know, like we think, oh, well, Vermont floods and somewhere else is in the drought, but no, you, actually, you, you Vermont, you we've had drought the last few summers and we've had tremendous, ridiculous flooding. Mm. You can get some Sorry. proportionality on this, Darren. Yeah, Look, yeah. With 100 raindrops, 99 fall on soils, 12 on average go into streams, two can be held in our dam where we get all our industrial, agricultural, urban water from. But it's what happens to the 99 on the land surface in the soil. Do they infiltrate, recharge these in-soil reservoirs, or do they flood, erode, and evaporate? Yeah. So, again, the magnitude of our capacity to build into a reservoir's resilience by just enhancing the sponge infiltration is enormous. So people like uh, Peter Andrews in Australia, um, people like uh, Bilzy Dyke um, yeah. in, in the United States and others yeah. who are similar. I mean, these are, yeah. these are, these are ostensibly the, uh, the human version of beavers. Um, well, you said it. <laughs> no, no, it's... It may bring away, the good stuff giving away, but see, the point is if we can get it into the landscape, the slow, continual recharge, the powerful thing here, Darren, is the longevity of green growth. That's where mm. productivity, mm. that's where resilience is, mm. and that comes from the sponge, the insoil reservoirs, not what's rushed down the creek and what we'll be able to save with leaky, de- with leaky dams, hopefully, right? Yeah, yeah. That the whole landscape becomes that sponge. <coughs> yeah, it's a, it's a real paradigm shift because we, we've 
we've been taught to think of water as something that goes sideways just by our culture. I mean, that's yeah. where we see it, right? So we're very literal as humans. Yes. So also, make a bit more cynical, uh, you see, that's water that is, in a sense, appropriated by governments and sold back to us. Yes. The water in the soil still belongs to nature. Yes. And, of course, it's not there to be traded. Yes. You know, it's part of nature's water. And so, yeah, people like to say, look, here's the water, you know, that 90% of runoff that is appropriated. Mm. You can sell entitlements and derivatives and all these other things on mm. Mm. But it represents, yeah, you know, a couple of percent of the total. And that's a, that's a great point. I remember years ago, the Bendigo advertiser um, during the, uh, I think it was the ni- one of the droughts in the 1990s, um, made the point that the biggest problem with Lake Epilock, which is a lake yeah. that supplies a lot of Victoria, well, northern Victoria with water, and uh, Bendigo, in fact, that's the city I'm from, said that the reason why it's not filling is because of all of the small earth dams but also because farmers are practicing soil conservation, exactly. and, uh, and and that that was robbing this reservoir of water. Um, yeah. It seemed a bit disingenuous to put it on that because anyone who understands hydrological function would would understand that uh, it doesn't quite work like that, does it? Well, but actually, yeah. So they want to concrete the catchment. Yes. When they do, they can only hold two drops out of 100 in their dams, which silt up anyway. Correct. 98 drops out of 100 goes then eroding offshore into the ocean. It's yeah. lost. Yes. And that's what we've got the next drought within weeks of having the flood. I just wanted to um, share a couple of uh, slides, if I could, um, just so, just to build on this, uh, this narrative. Um, I've got one here, um, which is from the upcoming water chapter of the Regrarian's Handbook, and um, which we haven't released yet, but we're just about to. And I think this play, I, th- I hope you can see what I can see yeah, on the screen yeah, there. Thank you. Um, the, the effects of raindrop impact. Um, yeah. It strikes me that that's somewhere where where we really start here is that when we do get it, you know, everything does start with the raindrop. And so can you, can you speak to a bit of that and how, how people might be able to uh, do better on that front? Because that's something that no one can regulate or stop you from doing. Yeah. Well, I think there's a couple of different pieces here. One is, as I think, I can't quite read the text, but as I think I'll you're just make, I'll just make that larger for you so you can. Uh, first of all, first of all, a falling raindrop um, has tremendous force, yes. and um, and it it can both compact the soil, but it will also move smaller particles around so that they fill in in between, and it can then seal things off afterwards. Um, and when you when you have uh, when you have plant cover, it's breaking breaking the fall. And it's also creating millions and millions of tiny dams there on the surface, that litter and the plant stems, et cetera, so that the water has to, has to stay a little bit, has to take its time before it starts moving sideways if you have any sort of a slope. Mm-hmm. So, so there's that piece. Uh, and I, I think you, you mentioned that you sometimes use Peter Donovan's uh, video to show the, the impact of having just even litter, not, not, not even to mention plant yes. growth. Um, on, on how how water moves when it hits when it hits the ground. Yeah. Um, yeah. The other piece, though, which if we were to, we'll, we'll be happy to make you a drawing. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, is is and here maybe we can just do it. You know, the, the particles, yeah. you know, the, that if that the other three things I would add here in the, in this little in this little thing is that when you don't have plant cover. The soil particles are all, because you don't have a sponge, because you're not feeding the microbial life that's creating a matrix underground, the particles are all touching each other. There's no void in there. There's no airspace. Mm. So there isn't actually anywhere for the water to go. No. Once you have, once you have plant cover feeding underground life, feeding the mycorrhizal fungi, pushing the root hairs, pushing through and, and dying off and leaving spaces, um, the, the humates 
collecting, all, all of that going on, all the stuff that the above ground plant life will do for you. Then, um, let's see, this is going to look backwards here. Okay, but, just let me just let me get that uh, bigger on the screen here. I'll just see how I can do that. Bear with me. Um, so we can, I think we can share our screen here. Yeah, I'll just, here, I'll just do that. that. Okay, go for it. So you have to stop sharing yours and then I'll yeah, share I do. mine. Yes, uh, pause share. That's me. Right, I go for it. I think that hopefully worked. Right, I go. Still not play. It's still at saying you're sharing. Stop share. There we are. There we go. Ah, that's okay. better. Um, I'll just make sure that that's coming through okay. I don't know if that will work. No, not really, but you can you do? <laughs> no, no, it's actually what it's doing, it's going to your screen as opposed to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, How about what I do? Just hold that up. Oh, hang on, what have we got going on now? Well, just explain. I can, I can just talk through it. There's, yeah, nothing, very, there's nothing here that's of any great import. Yeah, okay. Um, right, go, for, go for it. Um, go. So, so, what we have here, so. So uh, over here, these are, you know, without, without any plant cover and you have soil compaction and you have, basically, you don't have a sponge. You just mm -hmm. have mineral particles all touching each other. Just hold and that still. Just hold that. Oh, here we go. That's perfect. It's coming through perfectly now. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And go for it. And there's no, so there's, there's nowhere for the water to go because every, yeah. every space is filled with either sand, silk, or clay. Yeah. Once you have plant cover, building that soil sponge through all those relationships over time, then the carbon becomes these little bed springs mm. in between the particles. And, and then, you ha then you have voids in between them and there's lots of room for water to flow down. You think about the bulk density mm. of, of a compacted soil or a rock versus a, a very, um, you know, very healthy soil. I don't know, Walter's got yeah. the numbers, but. Well, yeah, you can see because a rock or sandstone 2.6, if it's rock 3.5, you bet a healthy soil 1.1, that means that 66% plus of the healthy soil is actually nothing. It's voids, it's spaces. Mm -hmm. Those voids, of course, where your roots grow, that's where your water infiltration, your water holding capacity, sustained availability, the surface of those minerals where your nutrient availability comes from, you completely change that soil of environment just by adding these carbon bed springs, we call them, mm -hmm. and you only need 2 or 3% carbon, and you've turned that rock of compacted, impervious, unavailable soil into actually a matrix of available water, air, rootability, nutrients. Mm -hmm. and radically change the life in that soil. Yeah, that's... Just by adding 2 to 3% carbon in these biogrammatic bed springs. Mm, that's amazing. So 66%, if I heard you correct, of a healthy well, soil will be, will be voids. Okay, and that's the difference between the bulk density of a healthy soil, 1.1 gram per cc, and just say a igneous soil, 3.5 grams per cc. Yeah. Simple. Yeah, okay. So while we're talking about all of this, I don't know that if the United States had uh, someone like Paul Strzelecki wandering through it in 1847, as we did in, on our continent, uh, Walter. Um, well, Lewis and Clark, you see, they are, they, okay. Uh, Jefferson did the Louisa, Louisiana Purchase from Napoleon yeah. um, in 1808 or 1803 or something. And then yeah. it was Lewis and Clark, 1812, just that. Mm. Went up the Missouri through Kansas, Flint country where we were. And of course, yeah, they did a lot of that documentation. Uh, enormously productive prairie soils. Another thing, I mean, critters, you know, like prairie dogs that were in the western Kansas area digging holes, like our little bandicoots and what have you. Billions of them, right? Yeah. Uh, and so really we're in a completely different ecology, soil ecology, resilient productivity from what we see now.
So when we'll, so there's explorers accounts like Lewis and Clark who said, you know, that yep. I could stand on the back of a horse and still not see over the grasses, et cetera, or yep. I had to tie, yep. or I was tying them, you know, in terms of Streslecki's work, as you'd be aware, um, with his study of the geology of the colony of New South Wales, that yep. uh, he did loss on ignition uh, carbon analyses yep. through that period. Um, if you, what, what credit do you, give, or not credit's not the right word, um, do, okay. how, how valid do you think that method was and, oh, look, and uh, still is? Okay, well, we took, I mean, CSRO, you know, where I was, we took that very seriously, published and republished it in 1903, not sorry, 1983, sorry, sorry, mm -hmm. 1983, uh, um, Soils and Australian view, Viewpoint, mm -hmm. the uh, definitive book on Australian soils. And look, no, totally verified, and of course it was loss of ignition. It turned out there were insects and you know all that biomass included, but they all add up to the soil biota. And now, Treslecki's data, the maximum was thirty-seven and a half percent carbon, which is almost a peat. <laughs> well, exactly, and well, exactly, and the wetlands that you talked about earlier, they get to that. And basically, even the poorest soils had 8% carbon. Mm. And that's consistent because, I mean, again, Oxley going across the Liverpool Plains, 1880, it had been just wet and he was complaining bitterly because the horses would sink up their fetlock every step in what he called mould, right? He didn't mm. call them soils, mm. this was mm. mould. Mould, yes. Mold. And the point is, why? Because we've got these very phenolic, Litters, we've got very low nitrogen in those soils, obviously, a whole landscape. And so we didn't have that carbon oxidation because of the phenolic litters and the low nitrogen. You know, you need 30 to 1 carbon nitrogen ratios for composting. Yes. And the carbon nitrogen ratio of these things were probably 60 to 1, right? Yes. So, yes, totally verified, but CSRO, absolutely, we had a long debate in 83. And no, no, the evidence is very clear, cross-verified. No, they were very happy to publish that as a mm. benchmark historical reference. Mm. That's, in, that's, that's incredible because it is, it's one of the few um, pieces that we have that not only, or, or that tie in the, the, the visual recognition of, of everything that's above the ground with what was actually happening under the ground at the time. And, and we don't have a lot of... Uh, damage, the whole story, mm. yes, it is there, right? Yeah. No yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to move over to... I'll just get this other slide up. To another part that we mentioned before. Um, Share screen again. There we go. Share screen. So I'll just play this. Um, so this is again, um, this is from our own work in the Regrarians mm -hmm. Handbook and in our present, one of our general presentations where we're looking at this process where we've got an existing situation and then we have various interventions. So this triptych is talking about, well, in some cases we'll have mechanical interventions. Yep. In other cases we'll have management, what I'll call management intervention. Yep. So we're using tools or we're yep. using management um, yep. with the objective that ultimately we get to a point where we have all of these physical, um, chemical and biological um, mm -hmm. uh, relationships which are forming, whereas at the start it's uh, there's... There's obviously physical, chemical, and um, and bio biological relationships occurring, but they're very they're very dis well they're they're very, very disintegrated and in some ways yeah. lacking yeah. harmony altogether. Yeah. Can you can you speak a little bit to these pathways? And uh, Didi, you yeah. mentioned before, um, you know that sometimes you you have to take in effect a, a bit of a step back. Well, do you? Yeah. Um, and how do you, because a lot of producers will be um, concerned of the financial implications of, of that transition. Yeah. Can, you, can you both speak yeah, a little yeah. to that, that transition and how we can play? Yeah. It's very important because obviously 
see like everything on this planet is chemical, right? <laughs> okay, I mean, we're made out of chemicals, stardust is chemicals, the earth is chemicals. And so this division of, yeah, physical, chemical and biological, I don't think gets us that far, but we can do much, much better than that, right? Yeah, yeah. I think the thing is, look, if we have a plant that's growing, any plant, any biomass, it's fixing solar energy, CO2, and basically putting it into the top, putting you know, 60% or so into the soil through its roots and through its exudates, right? Yeah. And so every plant, no matter where it is, is beneficial and helpful, right? But really what matters isn't chemical or physical. What really matters is what happens to every gram of carbon fixed by that plant. Yes. Right through history, you know, for 20 million years, only two things can have happened to that carbon. Mm -hmm. Only two things. It can either oxidize back to CO2 rapidly by burning or slow, you know, respiration, oxidation. Mm -hmm. Or it can get fixed into stable soil carbon. Mm -hmm. Only two things. And of course, our management, whether it's cultivation, excess fertilizer, clearing, excess biocides, fallowing, all of those things are accelerating oxidation, accelerating burning. So our industrial agriculture now puts 120% of the carbon fixed by the plants it grows back into the air of CO2 because it's also mining heritage, legacy carbon from the soil. Mm -hmm. And yet regenerative agriculture, just by changing that ratio of you know, burning to carbon sequestration, can put 60, 70% of the carbon into the soil as humates and glomalin rather than letting it burn. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's not a matter of you know, physical, chemical, biological, it's just a matter of wise land management, which in a way is biological, so not knocking biology. Yeah. But it's basically how do we manage the fungi in the soil that make the humates? How do we man manage the mycorrhizal fungi in the soil that manage to create the glomalin? How do we manage the herbivores above the ground that actually take that litter and stop it from burning and instead bring it in? Fertilizers and stable soil carbon and food protein. See, so these are all the management tools we've got, and and I think basically it's just let's stop burning or oxidizing as much by wise land management mm -hmm. and enhance the biosequestration of that carbon, as Alan has sort of talked about, back into the soil. Yeah. Now, clearly, what you've got there is physical. You have the cultivation of soils. Yes, it exposes soils to ultraviolet, kills the bugs. It massively increases the oxygen. And, of course, it drives oxidation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it's really our wisdom in that burning carbon balance, I think, where the future is. And really, there's some very smart, simple, natural ways of managing that can yeah, get 70% of the carbon into the soil mm -hmm. and can continually build that in a positive feedback system. Yeah. Diddy, did you want to speak to any of that as well? Um, no, I mean, I, I think that one of the pieces that sort of tie together the last two parts of the conversation is that the soil carbon, the importance of the soil carbon isn't necessarily so much about CO atmospheric CO2 because that's and a lot of that's going to get refunded by the ocean mm. um, you know over time and, and it's going to be a long time before we see a climate benefit by by increasing soil carbon but the beauty of the soil carbon is what we were talking about a minute ago that as you create that matrix underground that structural Thing, you're going to get a lot more nutrient availability, you're getting more rootability, you're getting more water, all of that, and then you get that length of green season. Yes. And when you get the length of green season, you have more transpiration. And one of the things that Walter's been talking about is that if we increase transpiration by 5%, that, that just that alone through the latent heat fluxes of pulling the heat away from the surface, releasing it out further out, that just that could be enough 
to pull the planet by those three extra degrees that are not getting re- not not leaving it right now. Mm, mm, mm. You know what we've done that human that human based cooling. Yes. Or that human based warming. That, that just increasing transpiration by five percent, and that could be five percent more land that had cover crops or re- reforestation, etc. But it could also be that our green season, the length of the green season, is five percent longer, and that's right. nothing. I mean, no. so that's that, that. That looks like a very easy thing to achieve, and we're not even talking then about the re-radiation heat effect. No. You know, that's that would be an additional bonus to that. Yeah. And then we're not, we're not talking about the human health benefits of all that nutrient availability being added in, yeah. or the or the water, or the you know the incredible filtration that that would provide for water before it comes back into human and animal consumption. Yeah. So there's and you know that's just the beginning of the list. So yeah. so it's really to me I've I've shifted from being very excited about the drawdown of atmospheric carbon to seeing this as a huge opportunity for public and environmental health on a, right. on a multifaceted level. So, yeah. yeah. Well, um, as I do, working with Abe Collins, a, a fellow Vermontian, um, yes. <laughs> um, he's, I don't know if you've been able to catch up with him at all, Walter, while you're in that lovely part of the world. But, uh, uh, no, no, yeah. Not yet, but I'm aware of that Abe stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, um, with his uh, program, pro- with his Landstream project, um, um, working with... Uh, the likes of uh, Gabe, Gabe Brown and John Norman and all of yeah. those sorts of, of folks. It's uh, it's clear that uh, you're on exactly the right path on, on that thinking, Didi. Yeah, and John, John and I have worked together very closely with writing of the um, Understanding Soil Health and Watershed Function, the, the manual. And yeah. he, um, one of my favorite things, actually, there are two things that I quote John on a lot. And John is a, his basic career is as a soil physicist at the University mm. of Wisconsin in Madison, uh, but he's really a biogeophysicist with an additional degree in botany, just for safety's sake. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and he, he said uh, that hydrologists study the movement of water across the landscape, yeah. and soil physicists study the movement of water into the land. Yes. And that neither one of them will write anything or study anything in the top few centimeters of yeah. Earth because they consider it too close to the other one's academic venue. You know, they're, that's, that's the door down the hall. Yes. Of course, that's the place where it's all happening, that edge, right? Yes. And that's the one thing that we never study. And I, I sat on the way back from mm. Kansas on the plane next to a woman who's doing atmospheric physics at MIT and and uh, UCLA, and she said exactly the same thing is true in atmospheric physics. That one of them studies this part of the atmosphere, and the other studies that part of the atmosphere, and they write papers saying, "Oh, this, you know, we're sure there's something here, but we'll study that later." Mm. You know, in terms of the edge, and yes, and and of course they're they're all writing and and studying and creating models as if their part of the universe was the only thing that existed and that there yes. was no interplay or no influence from no. One to the other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so, a really interesting thing. Uh, P. A. Yeomans, when he wrote his uh, key line scale of permanence, which is the basis to the Regrarians platform in 1958, um, he spoke of the first part of his scale of permanence was climate, and hmm. um, and he spoke not just so much about the climate of, of, of a place, the meteorological climate, but he spoke of the climate of the soil and, um, and that very interface that you're referring to. So it's not something that's necessarily that new, but, no, no. but definitely overlooked. <laughs> well, in a sense, you see, all of climatology 101 is based on those things. Yes. It's just really in the last 50 years, We've just been captured by this very small element, the CO2 greenhouse effect, and just looking at the symptom rather than the bigger context of what actually drives these balances and what has caused this symptom to happen, the CO2. It's really interesting. I'll just step from this slide that I've got here on the screen to um, my friend uh, Eric Tonsmeyer, who is uh, from New England, and I don't know if you've read, the, read or seen this book, uh, either of you. Yeah, it's, um, it's very popular. Yeah. 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 
It is very popular, and um, yeah, uh, Eric's now got a seat at Yale. One of the things that was interesting to me was this um, piece in here from that book, um, which sort of in part uh, relates to your point about, um, about studies. Um, it seems that um, when it comes to um, plant, uh, when it comes to woody plant ecosystems and, their, and the study of them as an effective means for carbon capture, there's, there's been a lot of that. And I, and I can see why, um, as someone who's done a lot of forestry, uh, forestry measurement is, relatively, mm -hmm. is a relatively uh, mature art, if not very yep. mature art. Um, and that, that we understand that most woody vegetation is approximately 50% carbon. And so it's a, it's rel it's a relatively easy one. We can, we can sort of use existing forestry menstruation and then transfer that into some sort of understanding of carbon capture. When it comes to soil carbon, and as you get down further here where you look at the number of studies, there's a lot of dots as you get down further down the screen here, particularly when it comes to what I would say, um, the kind of stuff that's, again, you know, we're, we're, up in this, we're up in the trees, but we're not down at the ground in terms of, mm -hmm. in terms of this. Can you, you, can you both speak to where we're at with all of this sort of analysis? And are we, and are, well, we, avoiding, yeah. are we avoiding what's really important to study? Well, well, I'm not avoiding, but we've been ignorant of it because, mm -hmm. yeah, we live above the ground and we've got professional foresters who've looked at that biomass carbon. Mm -hmm. Below the ground, again, we haven't focused on carbon in that way. But there's lots of studies that have demonstrated, as we said, how much carbon is in the soil. We've got about 2,300, 400 billion tonnes of carbon in our soils. There's about 700 billion tonnes of carbon in our forests. Mm. So straight away, here is soils holding three and a half times more than mm. forests. Yes. Uh, you know, our Redman forests in Australia, they'll hold up to 2,000 tonnes of carbon a hectare in their soils. Yes. Okay. A prodigious amounts because it's just deep spongy litter. There's people like Whitney, who's done a very major study on the whole east coast of the US, looking at you know how much carbon was in woodlands and soils and wetlands. And again, its soils are way above because the vast number of wetland beaver dams, as you say, they were just basically perched organic basins, right? Mm. And we drain them all, as you said, because that's where the cropping really started. We drain a beaver dam, we've got this fantastic organic soil to mine. Mm. And 95% of the wetlands on the East Coast have been mined that way, right? Mm. Mm. So the history is very clear. It, it's prodigious. I suppose up to now, it's, again, IPCC, the whole focus has been on CO2, forestry to some extent through the red scheme. But that's in a sense also being bastardized, excuse an Australianism. Yeah. And um, yeah, so we've just limited the context of our minds to understand the total carbon sinks and dynamics, right? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. When I read this book, um, I got this, and it's a very important piece, and I think it's great that Eric's done it. Um, I think. Part of the narrative structure of it, though, however, is I came away reading from it, reading that uh, trees were a bigger part of the solution than than um, the plant crops that we that we typically yeah. uh, get our sustenance from. Yeah, and I and I wonder whether that's actually um, it's guiding people more towards a tree-based solution than a than a holistic yeah. solution. Yep, Darren, but let's be rude about this. Basically, trees can't survive if they don't have a sponge, a soil carbon sponge yep. to provide them with the water. So, yep. you know, just simple first principles, you know. Yep. Start with the soil carbon sponge holding water. Without that, you've got cactus. If you're lucky, certainly not trees. Yeah. Well, that brings me to this slide, which I found at 3 a.m. one morning searching, <laughs> as you do. I was trying to, I, I think I typed in, and this was, a num this was back in the, in the noughties um, when I was doing the uh, uh, soil, water and carbon for every farm tour. And I was looking for a slide that, 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 that spoke to 
um, the way that different plants sequester carbon or that they, that in the way that they hold carbon. And this is one of the only diagrams that I've ever yeah. found that really described that. And I, and I, 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 I look at it and it speaks to a lot of truth. It's obviously of one particular biome and one particular mm -hmm. plant community, but it did speak a lot of truth to what I'd seen myself as someone who's cleared landscapes and who's pushed up trees with bulldozers and who's mm -hmm. you know, been involved a bit. Um, can, can, you, can you both um, um, have a... Have a uh, well, just make some comment on that slide that I've got here on the side because... As we talked about earlier, Walter and Diddy, um, it's not about the trees aren't important. Um, they are a very important part of the sort of ideal um, agricultural ecosystem we're trying to promote. But in terms of function here, can we just speak a little bit to the functioning? Yeah, go back to start and then Diddy to yeah, come in as well. Uh, okay, classic, classic analysis and nothing wrong with it. Obviously, grasses putting more particular humates into the soil, particularly over those first three depth layers, right? Yeah. question of humates. And what, in a sense, the slide is indicating on the second one, trees might go down a bit deeper in terms of the roots. See, what this slide totally misses is the carbon that they can't see and, of course, haven't measured, which are the mycorrhizal fungi, the guanolin produced by those fungi, which won't necessarily come up in these extraction methods that they've used, right? Yeah. A healthy soil will contain up to 25,000 kilometres of mycorrhizal hyphae proliferating through those soil particles, twice the diameter of the earth, in a cubic metre of healthy soil. And that, um, that hyphae is made up of a cell wall out of chitin, which is glucosamine, because yeah. when the hyphae move, I mean the fungi move on, leave that cell wall behind, that chitin glucosamine goes into chromalin. But it's yeah. not necessarily extracted. So again, with all science, we've just got to be a bit careful. It's context, it's method, and it's part of a story. And if it misses the elephants because they're not in the room, because they're too big to fit in the room, we shouldn't say elephants don't exist. <laughs> Did he? Uh, I don't have that much to add other than that being in Vermont, of course, I see, you know, I see this a lot moving between Vermont and, and like West as I travel. But here, I mean, we, you know, we have trees fall over and, the, the, you know, there's no soil there a lot of the time. The roots are spreading out sideways in this kind of a landscape and just holding on for dear life and the little wind comes along there, fall over and you start to see how, uh, how little soil they're building because you know that a lot of this these forests were there for a fair amount of time but on the other hand we've you know in Vermont we've destroyed a lot of our soils by cutting the forest down and then overgrazing on top of that and yes. now we're getting that second growth yeah. so it's um what, one thing though that that I was I was uh on a sign you know like a field trip with a bunch of students who were learning measure the carbon in trees and just another typical example of the oversight or our, our inability to see to see the soils for the trees <laughs> mm. is that they were learning to measure the amount of carbon and but they were doing it starting at the soil surface okay. and the roots aren't taken into the account at all mm. so that's but you know it's not not yeah. the same thing we were just talking about yeah. but but, but it's similar a yes. great example of how how hard it is for people to think here and yeah. Yeah. and and likewise um, when I talk about soil carbon, I'm saying it's, it's the living and the dead and the very dead. And so to me, soil carbon, when I think about it, it's, it's also the earthworms. You know, it is whoever's in there because that is CO2 that has been turned into life, right? Yes. I mean, if it's, if it's underground and it's got carbon in it, it's part yeah. of the soil carbon yeah. profile. It's, it, yeah, it's, very, it's, it's carbon in various states of life cycle. Yeah. And where, where people draw that line is very varied. So then we get very varied, you know, like the study you were yeah. talking about yeah. from 100 years yeah. ago, did they include the insect, you yeah. know? Yeah. Yes. Indeed. Another important point here too, look, I mean, this is this alpha male who's got the biggest one, right? Yes. And <laughs> the, point, the point is 
have I improved my soil from this con this content to that content, right? Yes. So where are the increments? What am I doing to restore, to regenerate? Not how big am I, or you know how much have I got? Yeah. You up yeah, you've got it. The point is, that have I taken this bare graded soil and have I just added, as we showed in that little diagram, one two percent carbon that are there as bed springs already functioning? Yeah. So we get hung up on quantity rather than yeah, that simple step of just doing it and building whatever you've got a little bit better. And, and really, I think what Walter's talking about there is that it's not about the measurement of carbon, it's the measurement of function. Yeah. So I don't care how much soil carbon you have. I care, is water infiltrating? And, or is it, you know, if it's, it may be infiltrating fine, but it's not staying at the root zone if it's too sandy. So, so it, it's like, is it is the landscape doing its, its God-given role in the whole cycle, right? Perfectly. Yeah. So. yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting one, and um, I think that uh, we uh, I think the function point is a really classic one. Um, one of the uh, I suppose one of the narratives, you know, in my in my history with this, I drank the soil carbon Kool Aid um, and was out there um, scouting around, saying, "All right, well, we need to have funding. We ha we need to have funding um, systems." to, you know, we need to be able to measure this stuff and get farmers paid. That hasn't come true. Um, and so the narrative that I now carry is that um, you just need to do this because it pays you to be, because it pays you to do so as a producer. Is that, so, is that, is that, is that where we're really at? Do you oh, think? Look, totally. It's the resilience, your capacity to infiltrate those a hundred raindrops extend your longevity of green growth, give you resilience at everything, and sure, down the track, and let's hope in Warsaw in November this year, the IPCC, UNFCCC, will come to carbon accounting. I have no hesitation that down the track, yes, we'll be measuring stable soil carbon increments from satellites. Mm. Just a matter of writing a few algorithms, which we can do, and then we've got all the data back to the 1970s we can then interpolate. No question we can do it. It's just a question of is the world ready to take this whole regeneration of healthy biosystems seriously? Mm. Or does it just want to keep on eroding, you know, mining its soil and its future? Like President Roosevelt, isn't it? A nation that destroys its soils, destroys itself, and there's plenty of nations on this planet who are just in that pathway. So a, a, a really important book, as you would acknowledge, um, uh, Walter, was uh, from, because you were in, in it, uh, was Charlie Massey's uh, Call of the Reed Warbler last year. And that instigated us at Regrarians and our um, handbook team, uh, Andrew Jeeves here, put yep. this particular slide together, or page, a couple of pages, where we were looking at, the, at what we've got and where we're looking at what we want to have and yep. we also looked at the comparison of set stocking and holistic planned grazing, or for want of a better term, yep. um, in terms of the range of different implications, um, which is what we've put in that graph at the bottom there, yep. where you're looking yep. at, yep. Where you're looking at um, a whole range of different functions, but also in terms of satisfaction, you know, human functions in terms of, uh, which is what... Um, Charlie has added as a dimension to yep. his, yep. you know, in, in holistic management, you've got, uh, you know, you've got uh, energy flow, mineral cycling, water cycle. Um, you've also got in Charlie's uh, methodology and understanding about, well, what's, what's the societal um, human yep. climate involved here, which is something that we've looked at as well. And that uh, um, when we're looking at job satisfaction and we're looking at profitability costs, um, farmer suicide even um, mm -hmm. th this is this is all very very integrated and so something that's quite a compelling story to take to somewhere like Warsaw yeah no question and I mean again it's very simple I mean Charles book of course last year but go back to King 1910 USDA you know farmers of the 40 centuries yeah and he was looking at China Korea Japan the only civilization that's been able to sustain over 500 million people for 4,000 years is through this organic soil management. 
We've had over 25 other civilizations that have gone cactus. You find them in the dust of archaeology because they haven't managed their soil carbon. Yeah. So when do we learn? You know, like it's there. Yeah. All to see. <laughs> yeah, no, it's pretty clear, isn't it? Um, now, I wanted to... we. Just on that tree thing, um, I mentioned to you earlier um, that I went to um, I went to uh, Delby uh, last week um, um, with the uh, Condamine um, Catchment Alliance up there, or the Condamine Alliance. They invited me to do a range of uh, farm walks uh, in the Toowoomba Delby Warwick region, and. When I was down in uh, the Delby area, the as I have been before, it struck me that the roadsides uh, and the remnants were of very dense brigalow country. So for people who aren't aware of um, this part of the world, it's um, in southeastern Queensland. Um, it's just on the inla inland side of the Great Divide, so it's part of the Murray-Darling Basin, uh, which is the biggest catchment in Australia and the most important catchment, if you like, from an agricultural perspective. And Brigalow country is, or the Brigalow plant community is a range of different, predominantly acacia and casuarina species, both of which are nitrogen fixes, which grow at pretty high density. Um, and uh, that's, a, that's a woody landscape type that will come back where there's no... Um, animal species that can control it or, or and including humans um, who uh, uh, have used fire to control that. Now, um, we were speaking about ideals as far as tree density in agricultural ecosystems. What do you, what do you see as being the ideal? Because obviously trees have a role to play. Um, yeah, again, it's, again, not what I see as an ideal, but it's just look at nature and look yeah. at the evolution and then, as Didi said, look at the functional synergies, symbioses and net, net benefits. And yeah, trees have got a critical role, but like anything, too many trees or trees out of control can become just as much of a problem as they can be a benefit. So it's, it's really, yeah, this, this balanced ecology. Look, trees very simply, they've got deeper root system. They're very effective as nutrient root pumps from depths and soil layers, bringing those nutrients, cycling them in the litter, and then adding nutrients into that biosystem, right? Yeah. They're also extremely valuable in stopping wind speed at the soil surface. And it's that wind speed at the soil surface which drives wind erosion, evaporation, scouring. So enormous effect in terms of keeping a more resilient, productive pasture. Yeah. And we've got all the studies, all the science is very clear that look, a grass under a shelter wood, an open scattered tree, optimum density, perhaps 100 trees per hectare scattered, you know, the grass there has got perhaps 80-90% of the weight but it's got 160% plus of the palatability mm. and protein feed value for the animals. So mm. just way above, whereas if you've got an open, bare, heat-exposed pasture, it might weigh a bit more, but all that weight is in cardboard, in sclerenchyma, yeah. which obviously takes a lot of energy and nitrogen for the animal to digest. Mm. So, I mean, yeah, there's a sweet spot, right? And yeah. it yeah. varies from... Location to location, system to system. It varies over time and the evolution of that system. And there's a nice balance herbivores, fire, drought, you know, that they balance this thing. And mm. obviously, we come along and we have dogma where we like trees or we don't like trees or whatever. Yes. And we impose completely artificial values. So Forget about what Walter says. Just go to a natural ecology <laughs> and then see, well, what is, what is that sort of balance of open shelter wood? How are the trees functioning? And then just listen to nature and try and say, okay, well, what, what's it trying to tell us here, right? Yeah. Yeah, look, these shelter woods, and, of course, we can convert them into very rational agroforests, you know, where we have innocent yeah. woods and laneways between exquisitely productive, exquisitely 
healthy in terms of biodiversity, regeneration. So really a no-brainer, right? Yeah. It was interesting. I interviewed um, Andrew Stewart and Rowan Reed, who are both quite prominent agroforesters and Australian agroforesters um, earlier on in this series. And uh, Andrew was uh, gave us a slide where he showed that on his landscape where he'd in, in incorporated, I think about just over five or six percent of that yeah. agricultural landscape into trees, that the biomass production, annual biomass production or annual saleable biomass production from that site was in the order of 200 plus tonnes of woody biomass in terms of posts and firewood and yeah. honey and, yeah. and uh, saw logs. Um, and it was about 70, uh, 70 tonnes of sheep. Yeah. So it's clear that, you know, from his uh, property's economic performance that uh, over those 20 odd years that he's been doing this, that there's been considerable benefits, not only to landscape function, but also to the farm's bottom line. Yeah. And resi- but just, yeah. Sorry. But just add, you know, because this whole California tour brought another factor in and of course this is the point about rainfall right I mean, yes. what role do these trees play actually positively in reinforcing not just rainfall but the whole water harvesting thing uh, the sequoias on the west coast they basically capture 70 percent of their moisture through fog mist mm. leaf drip in a harvesting not in rainfall and of course if you go up to the oak forests on the coastal range you again have to ask the question, how much of the moisture that those oak forests obviously had to grow on were actually harvested from these humid air flows? Mm-hmm. And as we aridify, which is the start of our discussion, it's water and aridification that are the crunch points. And really, it's very simple. How much does that tree cover? What role does it play in then? condensing and harvesting that moisture and retaining it in that landscape. And yet, in many cases, arid areas, it's absolutely critical. Yeah. Absolutely critical. I recall reading uh, David E. Smith's uh, book, Natural Gain, uh, quite a few years ago. Um, David passed, I think, last year, and he was the Emeritus Professor of Agriculture at the University of Melbourne. And Mm -hmm. uh, the book was largely about the role that he played in introducing um, the super phosphate and subclover revolution to Southern Australia. But he did, as a side note, mention that the most sustainable agricultural system that he had witnessed on the planet were the Daesa systems of Iberia, of uh, the widely spaced oak, uh, yep. oak woodlands and grassy oak woodlands of, uh, of Spain. Um, you will witness that yourself in part, the remnants of that in California where they have very similar. So the Spanish, in a lot of cases, when they went to California, they would have felt completely at home um, because the landscapes are very similar to uh, to those of Spain. And, yeah, and then they often cleared them, yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, unfortunately. Um, I uh, well, just to just to give you a bit of a sense of what's missing there. Um, this is <laughs> a, uh, a a site from the from the police to scene in Australia just prior to the last yep. glaciation. Um, I wanted to uh, cross over to where was I? Talking about um, other systems that are out there. Um, and just to give you a heads up, we've got about seven minutes left. So. Oh, have you? Okay, no worries. All right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get to where I was getting and then I'll just get this thing out of the way. And I can. Okay, here we are. So uh, I noticed, um, where is where did it go? Not there. Bear with me for two shakes. Ah, here we are. This was the one. Um, I just wanted to quick, because you are doing a bit of work in California, and California in, in large part in the US is sort of leading the way a bit. Um, I'll just get that share right. Stop share. And share screen. There we are. There we are. That's the one I wanted. Um, California in part is uh, 
leading some of the way. And part of the reason for that is the Marine Carbon Project, which I had a little bit to do with um, at the start of it, uh, when I cons Abe Collins and myself um, consulted to John Wick and Peggy Rathman and did their farm plan. Um, and John Wick and I, um, well, at, our, at his table, uh, sort of came up with the idea. Um, what do you think about um, the whole notion of using uh, compost as a means? Because that's, uh, I spoke about the, the one thing that's fairly clear to me is that um, physics don't lie. Um, <laughs> and you can sort of kid yourself, but you know, if you're putting in more energy than is, than is being um, taken out, if you like. Um, like. So if we make compost, how much energy is it taking to use that, to make that compost? And, therefore, and how much is actually being, um, well, what's the benefit of that? Could you, yeah. could you speak a bit of that? Much, and and you think have to go quickly on this, but just get to the guts of it. Yeah. Look, horses for courses, where you are, you're absolutely right. I mean, if you're investing more, energy or you're doing harm and doing something that you think is good, think again, right? Mm -hmm. but obviously, we've got this massive sink, which is urban areas, which gets a lot of food, obviously consumes most of the most of the plundering. And so if there's organic matter there for them to compost it and to sort of build soil, build urban agricultural systems on that compost and that degraded soil, yeah. you know, that's fantastic. But if you're thinking of trucking it around and spending massive amount of money and energy, then you've got to do that full life cycle analysis. And yeah, just a common sense. Um, in a broad acre, basically, you don't need to compost. It's not viable to compost. No. You get plants, microorganisms to the in situ natural composting. Mother Nature never had trucks and composted. No. She took all over the country. She just did it in situ. Yeah. through organisms and plants. But in urban areas, I uh, fully support all this green waste, getting compost, because that's where all our nutrients are, yeah. that's where a lot of organic matter is, and we have to rebuild that into productive agriculture and urban agriculture. We've got to empower, as you know, what will be 8 billion people living in cities to actually take control of a significant part of their own food, food future through compost, urban agriculture. The yeah. horses for courses, yeah. and yeah, all this is in this physics, it's common sense, it's logic into it, and yeah, we can't go wrong. Okay, well, that's fantastic to hear. And I would just add to that, um, that uh, one of the ways that nature composts and moves nutrients around is on what Walter's been calling mobile biodigesters. Yeah. That have four legs and an in intake yeah. valve and and then... <laughs> And I know, Don, you know, I know John's definitely working with grazing um, and add, you know, adding, adding that compost on top. So there's no, I don't think there's any argument with what he's doing, but I, I do sometimes feel like everybody, because they've done a great job of getting the word out about yeah. what they're doing, that people are focused on that as like yes. a slow way to manage the landscape. And it's yeah. one of myriad um, huge Part of choices that we could make in terms of improving a landscape in California or anywhere else. Yeah. And again, it's, you know, it's sort of um, a little bit too much emphasis on the drawdown piece and not enough on the function and the hydrology and the cooling and all the, all the other things that could be going. So, so, so let's come back it's, down it's to that. Let's, with it. yeah. Small, so, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I just needed to get that in because it is a really important point to not put all of our sort of eggs in one particular solution basket. It's sort of similar to the use of trees as one solution basket. So let's get back down to it just before we, we close up here. Uh, Ken Bellamy, who's an interesting character here in Australia for a variety of reasons, one of the things that he shared with me years ago um, was were these two uh, graphs yeah. that he'd made up where yeah. he looked at the, uh, well, two, well, he was introducing the, the notion that there's actually two different uh, photosynthetic pathways. It's not just through plants. There's also other organisms. 
uh, phototrophs yeah. in the soil. Can you speak to some of that? Yeah, very quickly, uh, and I'll have to close it. Yeah, look, yeah, yeah. The residual biosystems on this planet do about 120 billion tons of carbon every year, right? Yeah. We yeah. can double that if we regenerate land. It's more than enough drawdown. Um, I mean, fair enough, there's microorganisms in the soil, there's other photosynthetic pathways, but they're minuscule compared to that 120 billion tonnes of carbon. We've got green plants. Our job is to just make it happen, regenerate sponge, regenerate living green biosystem, longevity of green, we can get there. And actually, everything helps, but let's just focus on the main game. Yeah. Well, I was interested in this because... Um, from the perspective of these organisms, they they have water as an output in the soil, sure. um, and that that to me is 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 a pretty big thing. And that if we, sure. yeah. yeah, absolutely. But the, again, in proportionality, yeah. so you got to say, okay, well, look, is this going to change the world? Can we manage these? You know, are they accessible? And let's just get back to the main game. But we're not knocking what microbiology, obviously, that's where I come from. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can't get to the guts of this game because otherwise there's distraction and red herrings always, yeah. right? Okay, perfect. Just what I need to hear. Well, yeah, if, you're gonna, um, if you want to go, go up to the events tab and, and uh, hit it, and then, and then at the bottom of that, soil carbon sponge seminars, that's the, that's the whole That's the one, that's the page I should have. Okay. Yeah, there so tell us all about it. Where can we be? And uh, well, I right. can't, I'm not coming. But... <laughs> I don't know. You know better than I do. You're looking at this. Keep going. So, yeah, keep going down. We're uh, we're. Oh, you're April 25. So you're in. Yeah. Okay. So on, here we go. So we're on going the way to Harvard. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, tomorrow we're going to be in Fall River, Mass, at Bristol Community College, and then yep. at Harvard University on Thursday night. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, then we're off to Chicago for some meetings there. And uh, let's see. Yep. Yeah. Oh, actually, these are out of order here. But sorry about that. That's okay. um, Illinois. Uh, we're in Chicago. Two events on May first. Yep. Um, one is at the University of Chicago and with Argonne National Lab, which is our kind of equivalent of the CSIRO. Yeah. Great. And then, um, and then, and then one at a at a pub that looks kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, that'll, that'll go, back up, go back up a bit because those are that's the glass are, half full <laughs> yep. we'll go back up a little there oh pardon me pull up a, a bit yep okay and then we then we've got ohio so a um two-day two-day conference there with walter and peter Bain, yep. Yep. Peter. and then i think we've got another event or two in massachusetts and nofa mass well i know that comes after our vermont one so then we've got the big one is is our big deep dive, May eight through eleven, uh, yeah, great. which is a uh, second second version of our, our one last year. Yeah. Um, a day long one in Amherst, Massachusetts, uh, the day before Mother's Day, which is on the twelfth, uh, I think. Yeah. And then we. Uh, yep, yeah, right there, May twelfth, Amherst, Mass. Oh yes. Northeast Organic. Farming Association, yep. and then not, and then it's off to uh, Sweden. No, no. Oh no, Canada. 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 Yeah, yeah. Canada. Yeah. 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 So then there's another day long workshop there in, yeah. in Guelph. Yeah. So fantastic. Well, this is brilliant, and I'm sh I, I, I hope that the tour is um, getting all of the the numbers that it needs to to make it worthwhile from that perspective, but also getting uh, people along who are who are going to. Uh, take all of this and really run with it because it's absolutely important work that both of you are doing and um and a really um a really great tour that you've initiated so hats off to you and i wish you every success with it and thank um, you. and uh, and uh, really really thank you for your leadership in doing these things because you do put yourself out there in uh as i well know uh, when you put these things on so uh well done for that, and um, I really look forward to uh, the opportunity of meeting you both in person at some stage. Um, and give, and I'm very grateful for the time that you've been able to give us um, today. So thank you so much. Thank you for getting up early for yeah. us. You're yeah. no <laughs>
Back to sleep. Back to sleep. Yeah. Oh, no, I don't know no, no. sure that the viewers can see what the, um, how to get to that schedule. So I'll I'll, um, I'll, I'll post that uh, when, yeah, I, when okay. I when I do all of that. Right. So no worries. So they'll get you, all. I think if they see. look up DD Purse House and Soil Carbon Sponge, it'll yeah yeah, find it, so. yeah it's up there. The uh, there's the uh, the ad, the URL at the top there, so they'll be able to go there. Yeah. So okay. thank you so much, you two. It's been um, a rolling, rollicking conversation that obviously if we were at one of those glass half full events um, would go uh, probably to the hour where I started. Um, so uh, thank you ever so much. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And, um, and, and all the best with, with the tour. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye.